In 1941, Germany and Italy declared war on the U.S., thrusting America into the deadliest conflict in history. At this time, a vast expanse of the New Mexico desert was procured by the U.S. Army, leading to the establishment of Roswell Army Airfield. This extensive 5,000-acre facility proved to be an ideal location for training bomber crews for the war, eventually giving rise to the 509th Bombardment Group, the world's only nuclear flying crew. This unit was responsible for the historic nuclear detonations over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1948, the base underwent a renaming, becoming Walker Air Force Base in honor of General Kenneth Walker, renowned for his heroic engagements in the Pacific Theater. General Walker's aircraft was last spotted departing the battlefield while engulfed in flames, pursued by several enemy fighters. After accumulating significant debts during the Vietnam War, the facility was closed in 1967. Although operations here have ceased, the secrets remain. Secrets buried so deep, they slowly slip further and further from our grasp. As we peer into the distant past, we will be confronted by the truth, confronted with ideas that shake the very foundations of humanity. On Saturday, July 5, 1947, a rancher named Mac Brazell and his son Vernon rode on horseback on a remote ranch just outside of Roswell. The previous night, Brazell had heard a very strange explosion, something akin to an impact, but unlike thunder and incredibly loud. After a grueling search, what they discovered left them astounded. A debris field scattered across the earth, comprising wreckage and shredded metals that stretched over hundreds of feet and extended nearly a mile long. Brazell then drove 75 miles to the town of Roswell and reported this startling find to Chavez County Sheriff George A. Wilcox. The sheriff himself visited the crash site to verify the discovery and promptly contacted the military stationed at the Roswell Army Airfield. Sent to investigate is Major Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer within the 509th Bombardment Group. This is the man entrusted with the management of the utmost secrecy surrounding nuclear arsenals. In his role, he also oversaw the sole nuclear flight unit globally. With extensive expertise in aircraft materials and air travel, coupled with a background in radar technology, Marcel became the guardian of the military's most classified information and assets. Guided by rancher Mac Brazell, Marcel arrives at the site. After inspecting the wreckage and following the debris field, an astonishing discovery awaits him a disc-shaped object. Marcel's conviction is unwavering. This object could not be made by human hands. Hastily, he returns to base, carrying fragments of the craft and reports his findings to Colonel William Blanchard, the commanding officer of the base. Responding swiftly, a substantial number of troops are dispatched to the area, initiating an extensive recovery operation. Within a matter of hours, the entire vicinity is secured by armed guards. On the following day, Tuesday the 8th, Colonel William Blanchard and Lieutenant Walter Hoyt reach out to the press, revealing that the Roswell Army Airfield has successfully recovered an authentic flying saucer. By the afternoon, newspapers throughout the United States carry this remarkable account. I found some original radio announcements from July 8th. I was going to just read the transcript, but I feel that listening to the original puts things into context. And honestly, I think this is a very important part of the story. Take a listen. Headline edition, July 8th, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, 
reports that it has received one of the discs which landed on a ranch outside Rockwell. The disc landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Rockwell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disc looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Rice Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Rice Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying chopper to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. Well, at the time, the Wright Field facility was the Army's center for top-secret technological research. When foreign tech was recovered from the Germans or the Soviet Union, this is where it would be dismantled, studied, and yes, reverse-engineered. There was also some small fragments flown to Washington where President Truman was briefed and shown the material. All this news had caused such a stir. It's important to remember that the 1940s were much different from today. People were very concerned and confused about the revelations and the people of Roswell and the surrounding areas in particular were wondering what was going on. The actions of the military seemed panicked, and the entire area was a hive of activity. Many people in Roswell were concerned over the military response. The public were talking, and media agencies all over the country were scrambling to find out more. Surprisingly, Sheriff Wilcox takes Mac Brazell to the local radio station, KGFL. The men sit down and discuss what happened with Frank Joyce, a popular radio personality. Brazell tells Joyce that the crash was a flying saucer. In the wreckage were deceased beings that he can only describe as, well, not human. Upon hearing this, the station schedule a live broadcast for the following day, and Brazell agrees. But we'll come back to that later. At this time, intelligence officer Jesse Marcel is dispatched to Fort Worth, Texas, bearing a sample of debris there, he meets the infamous Brigadier General Roger Ramey. Ramey served in the Korean War and World War II. He quickly rose from colonel to commanding officer, and then to general. He oversaw the nuclear detonations on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands after 1946. Roger Ramey was known for his unwavering commitment to the United States. He was very well connected with the military's most distinguished individuals, and at the time with President Harry S. Truman. Shortly after Jesse Marcel arrives in Fort Worth, General Ramey announces an afternoon press conference. Just hours after the incredible front page news broke about a recovered flying saucer, Ramey tells the press that the crash was nothing more than a weather balloon. The men then pose for pictures, Marcel with a look of disbelief on his face, holding tin foil in his hands. Ramey claims this is the debris from Roswell, but both men know this is not true. By July 9th, one day later, Millions of newspapers come off the press. Now they have a very different story inked across the page. A brand new narrative emerges. The story now is that Colonel Blanchard and Major Marcel couldn't tell the difference between an alien spacecraft and a weather balloon. Rancher Matt Brazell also recants his statement. He issues an apology letter to the media saying he is sorry he talked about it and all he really seen was tin foil, some tough paper and some sticks. Then he goes silent. No one hears from him again. Years later, with testimony from his family, it was discovered that Matt Brazell had actually been detained by the military around July 8th. Strangely, as soon as things settled down, he left his job as a rancher, was seen in a brand new pickup truck, and quickly moved to Alamogordo to start a business. Jude Roberts, the owner of KGFL Radio, eventually claimed that she was forced not to proceed with Brazil after receiving calls from the FCC and U.S. Senator Dennis Chavez. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. With the war ending just two years earlier, United States demonstrating such dominance in a new world order, there was a sense of support and trust between the public and the government. In 1947, if the authorities said something, it was believed by the people. Sadly, that seems inconceivable nowadays. So let's piece this together. 
After a significant explosion, a debris field is discovered, and a crashed craft is reported. The local sheriff inspects the site, as does the military's top intelligence officer, Jesse Marcel. The base commander, Colonel Blanchard, then initiates a cleanup and recovery operation involving hundreds of troops and vehicles. Pieces of material are subsequently transported to Fort Worth, Texas and Washington, D.C., while the craft itself is sent to the reverse engineering facility at Wright Field. We can assert all of this with confidence, as we've heard the radio announcement from July 8th, and this information was directly conveyed by Ramey himself. So how can we accept this? A weather balloon, a large mogul balloon, or any prototype balloon of that nature, could not have caused an explosion leaving debris scattered for almost a mile. It certainly would not have confused the very individuals responsible for overseeing such operations. Considering that the majority of witnesses are military personnel who are unable to discuss what transpired, this story is largely accepted, especially by individuals outside of Roswell. These highly distinguished men in charge of the most powerful weapons arsenals on Earth look totally incompetent. But don't worry. In 1978, the dark secrets from Roswell would begin to ooze from the deepest corners of government secrecy. At 71 years old and in ill health, Major Jesse Marcel would get to tell his story. After being persuaded by researcher Stanton Friedman, Major Marcel sits down in his garden. He and Stanton face each other with cameras rolling, and he begins to speak. He boldly declared that the entire Roswell incident had been a cover-up, encompassing everything from the balloon story to the debris in the photos and more. Not only did his claims support the original announcement of a flying saucer, but Marcel also accused Roger Ramey and the entire military of orchestrating a massive cover-up. What made this revelation truly remarkable was Marcel's unique position as one of the first witnesses to the crash site and his appearance in the historic photos featuring Roger Ramey and the staged weather balloon. 31 years later, the floodgates opened as hundreds of witnesses began emerging. Glenn Dennis was a mortician in Roswell. He claims he was at the base hospital on July 8th after taking an injured pilot to the emergency. After seeing a series of vehicles loaded with what he says looked like aircraft debris, he is approached by military officers. When he asks what crashed, he is detained and threatened by these men. He states that after being punched, he was warned that if he speaks about what he's seen, someone will be picking his bones out of the sand. He also alleges that he knew a nurse who had recently started working at the base. In the days following the incident, she contacted him to discuss the events. According to Dennis, she was overwhelmed with fear and became physically ill while revealing that severely mutilated creatures had been brought to the base hospital. She also had sketches of small beings with long arms and large heads. After repeated attempts to reach her in the following days, Dennis discovered that she had been transferred to London and tragically died in a military helicopter crash. Barbara Duggar is the granddaughter of Sheriff Wilcox and his wife Ines. She claims her grandmother told her that both of them were threatened by military personnel a short time after the crash. They were allegedly warned that if they spoke about what the sheriff had witnessed, their entire family would be killed. Additionally, she asserts that her grandfather did indeed witness a crashed flying saucer and bodies on the ranch. Brigadier General Arthur E. Exxon was a lieutenant colonel stationed at Wright Field at the time of the crash. He was promoted to colonel at the Pentagon in 1955 and became the commanding officer of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1966. He was the highest ranking official to corroborate the claims of an extraterrestrial crash. In the 90s, he made claims that the Roswell crash involved a flying saucer and that there were beings found with the wreckage. He also claimed that during his career, he was aware of UFO retrieval and control programs. He nicknamed them the Unholy 13. Robert A. Slusher was a flight engineer for the C-24 flight crew. His testimony stated that he accompanied bodies in crates from Roswell to Fort Worth in Texas. At the beginning of this story, I mentioned Lieutenant Walter Hoyt. He was the man who issued the original press statement under Colonel Blanchard's command. Incredibly, Lieutenant Hoyt signed a sealed affidavit, only to be opened after his death. In 2005, he passed away and the affidavit was released by his family. Since it is quite lengthy, I will only read approximately half. 
However, if you would like to view the entire document, there are links provided in the description. It reads, In July 1947, I was stationed at the Roswell Army Air Base in Roswell. Colonel Blanchard took me personally to Building 84, a B-29 hangar located on the east side of the tarmac. Upon first approaching the building, I observed that it was under heavy guard both outside and inside. Once inside, I was permitted from a safe distance to first observe the object just recovered north of town. It was approximately 12 to 15 feet in length, not quite as wide, about 6 feet high, and more of an egg shape. Lighting was poor, but its surface did appear metallic. No windows, portholes, wings, tail section or landing gear were visible. Also from a distance, I was able to see a couple of bodies under a canvas tarpaulin. Only the heads extended beyond the covering, and I was not able to make out any features. The heads did appear larger than normal, and the contour of the canvas over the bodies suggested the size of a ten-year-old child. At a later date in Blanchard's office, he would extend his arm about four feet above the floor to indicate the height. I was informed of a temporary morgue set up to accommodate the recovered bodies. Upon his return from Fort Worth, Major Marcel described to me taking pieces of the wreckage to General Ramey's office, and after returning from a map room, finding the remains of a weather balloon and radar kite substituted while he was out of the room. Marcel was very upset over the situation. We would not discuss it again. I am convinced that what I personally observed was some type of craft and its crew from outer space. This statement is to remain sealed and secured until the time of my death, at which time my surviving family will determine its disposition. Signed, Walter G. Hoyt, December 26, 2002. A young boy lay sleeping in a small suburban home. It's Sunday, and everything seems normal. At around 1 a.m., a car pulls up in the driveway, and the boy's father rushes into the home. In a state of shock and excitement, he wakes up his 11-year-old son and his wife, telling them he has something incredible to show them. In a somnolent state, they walk out from their rooms and see pieces of metal and debris spread across the kitchen floor. They are incredible. These objects feature strange hieroglyphics and shimmering purple hues in the light, thin sheets of alloy that don't have any weight but cannot be bent or dented. The man tells his wife and child that these objects came from a flying saucer that crashed outside of town, truly something from another world. He then gathers up the pieces and tells his family he has to take them to the base immediately and rushes off, not to be seen again for days. This boy's name is Jesse Marcel Jr., the son of Major Jesse Marcel. As it turns out, on the night Jesse Marcel inspected the crash site and collected small sections to take back to Colonel Blanchard, he passed by his home en route to the base. He made the decision to stop and share what he had found with his wife and son. This would become a crucial piece of the puzzle. In a 1997 televised interview, 61-year-old Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. made this statement. My dad came into the house very excited. He wanted my mother and me to look at what he had gathered up in the field off of a ranch northwest of Roswell. At that point, I was not quite sure what a flying saucer was, but I was certainly eager to see why he was so excited. I've lived with this for 50 years, and again, I'm not sure what it was, but I do know what it wasn't. The strangest thing among all the debris that I saw was the beam. It was a metal rod. 12 to 18 inches long with these purple-violet hue figures written along the inner surface. When I picked this beam up off the kitchen floor, I looked at it and didn't see anything too unusual until I held it up to the light. That's when I saw these symbols. They were very faint and could have been easily missed. After we loaded the debris back into the car, I went to bed and my mother went to her room. I remember my dad was gone for a few days, but when he came back he was very serious about never discussing this again. He told me to treat it as a non-event, that it didn't happen, and we never spoke of it again. Shortly before he died, I called him and we talked about it. I asked him if there was any possibility that anything was still left out there at the crash site, but he said they had vacuumed up the whole place, and there'd be nothing left. After numerous allegations of a cover-up, the military was compelled by Congress to release a report on what truly occurred. 
In 1995, the Air Force published the Roswell Report, fact versus fiction in the New Mexico desert. Essentially, it admitted to lying about the initial balloon story and confirmed an intentional cover-up. According to the report, the object in question was identified as a mogul balloon, which was top secret at the time. Many people rejected the report, primarily because numerous individuals directly involved in the event had come forward by that time, and the report did not provide a comprehensive explanation. It made no mention of bodies, and people weren't convinced. Two years later, in 1997, a follow-up report was released titled, The Roswell Incident, Case Closed. This report attempted to explain that the bodies reported by many witnesses were actually test dummies dropped with parachutes and were often transported in body bags for testing. The report indicated that these tests were conducted in the mid-1950s, years after the Roswell incident. The Air Force's official stance is that all those traumatized people who witnessed the crash somehow confused it with test dummies they saw years later. In addition to this, miraculously, all government documents regarding the Roswell base have been destroyed. Yes, destroyed. There is nothing left in the archives, and the official explanation from the DOD is that an agency within the government had destroyed everything between March 1945 and 1949, but they don't know who. On September 15, 1950, a remarkable meeting took place in Washington, D.C. The meeting was convened by the U.S. Department of Defense Research and Development Board, known as the RDB. What was discussed in that meeting was truly astonishing. Unfortunately, the subject of this conversation would remain unknown to the public for more than 30 years. In 1981, Canadian researcher Arthur Bray stumbled upon a classified memo describing a conversation in the meeting between the renowned physicist Robert I. Sarbacher, a consultant with the RDB, and a group of government scientists from the U.S. and Canada. During the meeting, Sarbacher was asked about the rumors of a UFO crash, to which he replied, Yes, the rumors are correct. UFOs do exist. We have not been able to duplicate their performance. All we know is we didn't make them, and it's pretty certain they didn't originate on Earth. After the memo leaked, Sarbacher, now 76 years old, confirmed that the details of the meeting were accurate and discussed what he knew in a letter to researchers William Steinman and the renowned physicist Stanton Friedman. He revealed that in the early 1950s, he was officially informed about a crash of a non-terrestrial craft in the Southwest, a crash that occurred at that time or likely sometime prior, and may well have been the crash from Roswell. He confirmed that the subject was classified higher than the development of the atomic bomb. Sarbacher mentioned lightweight, strong materials and the presence of alien beings. He also noted a group of known scientists who were likely involved in the analysis of the crash debris, including von Braun, Vannevar Bush, Oppenheimer, and Eric Walker, among others. He explained that they were attempting to reverse engineer the technology, but had been unsuccessful. In the late 1970s, another damning memo surfaced. This document was authored by Guy Hoddle, who at the time was the head of the FBI field office in Washington, D.C. The letter is addressed to J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. Although this letter is dated March 22, 1950, many believe the reported recoveries are related. There are some names redacted. The letter reads, To the director, an investigator for the Air Force stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine material. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. According to Mr. Redacted, the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in that area, and it is believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. No further evaluation was attempted by Redacted concerning the above. Wow, I would really like to know the name of the Air Force informant. I think there's a good chance it's somebody we already know from this story, don't you? It's been 76 years since this incredible event took place. Unfortunately, most of the first-hand witnesses have passed away. However, I honestly believe that there are people who have access to the whole story, 
access to materials, beings maybe. I believe that all the supposedly destroyed files are, in fact, very well preserved. Hidden in the dark, under lock and key, guarded by the keepers. The keepers of the greatest secret this world has ever known. It's interesting because while I was creating this video, the most recent whistleblower, David Grush, did an interview with Jesse Michaels. He states that Robert Oppenheimer was involved in the secrecy and reverse engineering of these recovered vehicles, mirroring what Robert Sarbacher said 40 years ago. Grush claims that the classification structure developed for the Manhattan Project was also used for UFOs by the same team. In 1966, a scientific investigation into UFOs was conducted by the Condon Committee, which is said to be the most influential debunking of UFOs ever. That study was led by Edward Condon, who was a scientist on the Manhattan Project, and it was funded by the U.S. Air Force. The eyewitness testimony in this story is remarkable. It's difficult to determine how to interpret it. The notion that there were beings involved in the crash appears far-fetched, yet so many claim to have seen them. It's a challenge to wrap one's mind around, but the Air Force's dummies explanation leaves me with questions. I've attached links to the Robert Sarbacher letter, the FBI memo to J. Edgar Hoover, and the affidavit signed by Walter Hoyt. As for the newspaper clippings, they should be relatively easy to find through a simple online search. The 11-year-old boy in the story, Jesse Marcel Jr., followed in his father's footsteps. He became a doctor and joined the Navy in 1962. After serving in Cuba and eventually Vietnam, Dr. Marcel became a flight surgeon and retired at the rank of colonel in 1996. Following the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Dr. Marcel requested to be reactivated for duty to serve as a flight surgeon with the 189th Attack Helicopter Battalion. In 2004, he deployed to the Balad Air Base in Iraq. He underwent a 14-month tour of duty where he logged 225 flight hours in combat. He was 68 years old. I'd like to thank you for watching. I plan to cover a new case every few weeks, so if you enjoyed this one, subscribe and hit the bell. If you're daring and want to delve even deeper into the Roswell incident, I highly recommend the book Witness to Roswell. The book is authored by Thomas J. Carey and Donald R. Schmidt. I'll attach a link for that also. Until next time, good night.